Welcome to chapter 13. This is on filtering strategies and we're going to cover the following key points. First of all, we're going to talk about filtering generally with DynamoDB and how it's different than a relational database. And then we're going to walk through six strategies for filtering. Number one, filtering with a partition key. Number two, filtering with a sort key. Number three, using composite sort keys. Fourth, using sparse indexes, which is my favorite part. And then some other interesting patterns of using filter expressions or client side filtering. So let's talk about filtering with DynamoDB generally. And really, no matter what database you're using, filtering is really gonna be an important part of it because really you have this giant mess of data and at times you want this part but not that part or that part but not this part. So you need to figure out a way to efficiently get exactly the data you need. Now, if you're coming from a relational world, you're used to this very flexible SQL syntax where you have all these filtering options. You can add in this where clause and filter on all kinds of things. You can filter on a column in your table. You can join a, a table and filter on one of those columns, or you can use a function such as the current time to filter on that. You don't have that same sort of flexibility in DynamoDB. You need to be very intentional about how you're gonna filter in DynamoDB. And the key point is that almost all your filtering happens with the primary keys. Now this can mean the primary key on your main table, this can mean a primary key on your secondary index, but you have to use that primary key to filter down your data if you wanna have efficient data access with DynamoDB. So the first and most important strategy you're going to use is gonna be filtering with that partition key. You've already been doing this a bunch in the previous chapters and we just didn't really say it out loud. But again, let's go back to what happens every time you're making a request to DynamoDB. When it hits that DynamoDB request router, it's gonna hash that partition key and find out which partition that data is located on. So if you have a table that's a terabyte, you're not searching across an entire terabyte, you're narrowing it down to a one gig, two gig, maybe 10 gig partition to find the data that you want. And this is really helping narrow it down. So going back to that movie roles table we have, you know, we have all these different items and we have to include that partition key with our query, with our get item, any of that is gonna narrow it down right to the partition we want and filter out that other data that doesn't match. Let's move on to the second most common filtering strategy you're gonna use, and that's filtering with the sort key. And there are two big patterns here that you use with the sort key. First is when the sort key itself has meaning. So let's go back to this IoT example that we've looked at before where we have uh, a sensor and a sensor is sending up readings. The partition key is that sensor ID and then the sort key is that timestamp. You can see there the timestamp itself is meaningful. So you could search for records within a particular range if you wanted to. For example, here, you know, if I want to get the, the records between uh, a minute after midnight and two minutes after midnight, I could quickly go and get that. And the, the key there is that sort key actually is meaningful. A second and, and probably more common situation is when the sort key has meaning based on how you've modeled it. So let's see what that looks like here. This is gonna be an example from later on in uh, one of the data modeling examples as we model out GitHub. But what we've done here is we have a single item collection and we're modeling two one-to-many relationships in the same item collection. So up top there in the green, we have some issue items. The middle there in blue, we have a repo item. And then below that in purple, we have those star items. And based on what sort of access pattern we have, what group of items we wanna collect, we'll use different conditions on that sort key. So one thing we can do is say, hey, give me the repo and all the repos issues. And we can do that here and we'll add conditions on that sort key to, to get the proper items. Likewise, we can do the opposite and say, hey, give me the repo and all the star items. And what we'll do is we'll sort the other way. We'll use different sort key conditions and grab just those items. Now, the important thing there is that sort key is just sort of arbitrary. It's what we've defined it as to enable these access patterns. It doesn't have inherent meaning like that timestamp did before. Let's move on to the next strategy, which is a composite sort key. And we've already seen one example of this before, but with, with a composite sort key, what you're doing is encoding multiple values into that sort key. So that example we did before, this is in that one-to-many relationships chatter, chapter where we had that composite sort key and we were storing Starbucks store locations. And you can see that in that sort key, we're storing multiple values. We're storing the state, the city, the zip code, and the store ID. There's another pattern that we can use here that's pretty common. So let's check this out. Imagine you had an e-commerce store where customers are making orders and these orders have order IDs, amounts, but on the far right there, we have an order status, which could be you know placed and shipped and delivered and canceled. Um, or And there's also an order date. And that order status, you're gonna do exact match on, but that order date, you might wanna filter and get a range of items right between January and March or something like that. One thing we can do is imagine you want to sort of combine those filters where you want to say, I want to get all the items that were canceled 
between a particular date. If we wanna have really efficient access patterns where you're combining that filter on the status and the filter on the date, we'll need to combine that into the primary key somewhere. So this is what we'll do, create this new attribute called order status date. And that attribute is gonna be the combination of order status and order date. And, and you can see that there to where we've combined those two and just separated them by uh, the pound sign. Then we'll add a secondary index that uses the customer ID as the partition key and this new order status date composite key as the composite sort key there. It looks something like this and now we can see that. And now if we wanna search on a particular status within a particular date range, we can do that easily. So if we wanted to find all the items that were canceled between um, June of 2019 and December of 2019 for this particular user, we could do that and find that individual item right there. So the composite sort key is good when you always want to filter on two or more attributes in a particular access pattern. So in that last access pattern we had, we wanna always filter on the order status, but also that order status date to filter within there. The key thing you need is that at least one of those attributes needs to be an enum-like value that has a limited number of options that you're always gonna do an exact match on. So that's what we had with that order status date. That order status is an enum. There are only a couple different options that it can be. We'll do an exact match on that, and then we can do a range query on that later value if we want to. All right, let's move into the fourth filtering strategy, and this is sparse indexes. And this is a really fun one, one of my favorites. Uh, let's see how you can use that. But what's going on here is that when you're creating a secondary index, only the items that have all the elements of that secondary index's primary key will be copied into that secondary index. So if you create this GSI 1 PK, GSI 1 SK, and some of your items have those values, but some of them don't, the ones that don't won't be replicated in there. Now, what you can do is you can actually use some strategies around that to provide a global filter on your data. And let's check that out. There are two different strategies I like to use. The first one is when you're filtering within a particular type of entity based on a condition. Let's take a look at that using our SAS app example that we've used again before. Imagine we have an access pattern where we want to be able to find all the administrators for a particular organization. And you can see there is that admin role property on, on these different users, but it's not built into the primary key, so we can't efficiently query on that. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna add these GSI1 PK and GSI1 SK values. And for each user item, we'll add those GSI1 PK and SK values in there so that they get replicated in this secondary index. But one thing to note there, look at Charlie Munger. He's a user, he has a role of member, we're not going to copy those attributes for him because we don't want him to be included in this GSI one, which is only going to include those admin users. A second thing to notice here is also notice that our organization items, the Berkshire organization item, the Facebook organization item, they have GSI one PK and SK values, but they're being used for a different access pattern altogether, not for this one. So the key here is that we're filtering within this particular item type within users. We're only including users that have that admin role. Now, when we look over at our GSI, we can see that within a particular organization's partition key, we can find all the admins very quickly. Here, for example, is Warren Buffett, who's an admin of Berkshire Hathaway. Charlie Munger has not been copied over into that. Now, because we're only filtering within that entity type, you can still use this with that overloaded keys and indexes pattern that we've seen before, and you can just have different strategies that you're using with your other entity types in there. Now the second type of strategy with a sparse index is we want, where we wanna project only a single type of entity into a secondary index. So let's look at this access pattern here. Imagine, imagine we have an e-commerce store where we have customers, we have orders, we have inventory items, and we have an access pattern where we wanna get all the customers in our store. You know, perhaps our marketing team wants to fetch all the customers and send them some marketing email. They don't wanna scan that entire table, get all the orders, get all the inventory, all that stuff just to find those customer items. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna add this attribute called customer index ID, and we're just gonna put the user ID in there. So here we have Alex Debris and Barry Bonds. You can see that the customers have this attribute, but the orders and inventory items do not. Now we'll create a secondary index that uses that customer index ID. And so if we look at this, the only items that are projected into that secondary index are those customer items. We don't have orders, we don't have items, any of that. Now we can scan that index directly to get just down to that type of item we want. Now, notice that this does not work with that overloading keys and indexes strategy because what we're doing is we're filtering down to an item type. So that means we can't have other types of in items in there that are using different strategies. So this is different than that first strategy we used for sparse indexes. Now the last two strategies we're gonna cover are a little bit different because they're not using your primary key. So that separates them from those first four strategies. And the first strategy we'll talk about here is that filter expression, which we've talked about for. And what you can do here is on that query or scan operation, you can include this filter expression to exclude um, 
items that don't match your particular filter expression. And you can do this on non-key attributes. Now, as we noted, this will not save your bad query patterns. So do not rely on this to, to really help you. You should only use it in specific circumstances. And remember why that filter expression won't help you. That filter expression is applied after the items are read for the table, which means you're already subject to that one meg limit and you're already paying for reading for all those items. This is just a little bit of a nicety to help you filter out some items that don't match. So a couple different scenarios where you might want to use filter expressions. Number one, it does reduce that payload size that you're sending from the DynamoDB server over to your application, which can speed up that response time. Number two, it can make for a little easier application filtering because if you're going to retrieve a bunch of items and then just filter out a bunch that don't match a specific condition in your application code, some people choose to do that on the DynamoDB side rather than in their application code. The last thing you can do there is you can get a little better, better validation around that TTL expiry if you want to where DynamoDB doesn't have an SLA around how quickly they're going to delete items for that TTL. So if you're counting on those items to be expired as part of your business logic, you can add a filter expression here just to make sure you don't get an item that should have been deleted. This final strategy isn't really a DynamoDB strategy at all, but it's one you need to keep in mind when you're thinking about your application as a whole, and that's client-side filtering. So what you're going to do with client-side filtering is you're going to filter results in your backend server or on the front end rather than in DynamoDB. And a lot of people, when they're modeling out their application, they get hung up thinking they need to do everything in DynamoDB, and maybe they have very complex filtering patterns that they need to model out, and, and they're adding all these different secondary indexes. And, and just think, you know, can I use the client side here? And, and Rick Houlihan likes to say, that browser's sitting in a 99% idle loop all the time, you know, give it some work to do. So this is a really good uh, strategy to use when two things are true. Number one, that filtering is difficult to model in the database. So maybe you're filtering on a lot of different conditions and maybe like filtering and ordering on a lot of different conditions and you're, and you're sort of tying yourself in knots that way. But also your data set just isn't that big. You know, if you're only talking about um, half a meg or, or less of data, maybe you just grab all that and do the filtering and sorting on the front end rather than trying to do it on API requests and hitting DynamoDB. So that concludes the filtering section of this book. Uh, just a quick summary of what we covered here. Number one, we talked about filtering with DynamoDB and how it's different than filtering with a relational database where you can add indexes, you can use this flexible where syntax to, to filter anything you want. But with DynamoDB, you really need to build it into your primary key, whether that's on your base table or whether that's in a secondary index. Then we walk through six different strategies for filtering with DynamoDB. The first two are both using, you know, the bare elements of your primary key. So use filtering with a partition key, filtering with a sort key. Uh, the next one gets a little more advanced where you're using a composite sort key by encoding multiple values into that sort key. Uh, the fourth one is, is my favorite. That's using sparse indexes and the two different strategies there where you're filtering within an entity type to, to exclude certain items or where you're projecting only a single type of entity into that sparse index. The last two are uh, additional ones that don't operate on your primary key, but can be additional options that help you out. One is that filter expression that's built into DynamoDB. Again, not going to save your bad table design, but can help out in a few scenarios. And then that last one is, is just doing some filtering on the client side, whether that's in your application server or on the front end in the browser. Um, you know, if you have some, some bandwidth there, just, just do it there, especially if the data is small and you have really complex patterns. That concludes this chapter 13. In chapter 14, we're going to talk about sorting within DynamoDB, so go check that out.